part of the brilliance of Salesforce at the beginning was it was all it, it all this stuff that that Benioff did all fit together. So being on the cloud, so you had to serve it over the internet. That made sense to shift to a subscription model instead of the sort of per seat license model or per core license model. All these things that that, that you, or sorry, the, the, like the the installation you know license models. Actually, what I mm-hmm. should say instead of it was subscription instead of license, and also like all their marketing, like all their guerrilla marketing things like that. Why did that work? Because you're actually it's more of a PR thing because you're trying to reach lower levels of the company, like the mass public, because they could just go. In, you can do trials, right? You can't do trials if you have to go in, install the software on your on-premises thing, that's all a top de- down sale. And then you have to go through and then maybe after a year and a half, if it works, then you can actually, <laughs> that's your first time actually trying the product, right? Yeah. And so, whereas with Salesforce back in the day, some random salesperson could just walk up to Salesforce and try it out because it's already installed because it's, it's, a, it's a cloud service. And so all those things went together. So the question is, as we shift to these new models, does that just layer on nicely? Or if you think about AI, you know, and someone doing a job in place of a person, you know, that's more of a usage model, right? You're paying for something to be accomplished. And as part of their agent force, they have like a call center product, I think, you know, like an obvious sort of AI application. Everyone, that that's the obvious one. I was like, well, of course, call centers, AI, that mm-hmm. makes sense. I think they're charging like $2 per completed call. So it's basically like, you know, so how many calls can an AI complete in a day? What's that equivalent for an actual employee and sort of figuring that out. But that's a, it's a fundamentally different business model. And so that will, will existing companies be able to adjust to that or will it sort of go in the other direction? And Salesforce has shifted a bit. It's not, Salesforce isn't just a CRM. Like the CRM sits on top of a platform which is the sort of force.com sort of platform. And they, that has, and there you could, as a developer, you can build on top of that. They have their own app store, like where you can go and like find things that work with all your stuff together. And that has usage-based pricing. So, so it's not like usage-based pricing is completely foreign to them, but all of this is sort of up in the air. What's the right business model? What's the right approach? How do you get the data? All those sorts of things. And, you know, I think their, their, their argument so sorry that, that that that's that's part one. Yes. Part two. Benioff's argument is that, and he sort of pushed back on my supposition that agents, you know, the the first wave AI is is like employee replacement in many respects. So he, he did push back, but then he also invoked an example and he laid out sort of an agentic use case for doctors' offices and healthcare providers, where an agent calls you to follow up and schedule appointments. Right. And that did sound to me like a it would expand the capabilities of various healthcare practices. But it would also render a lot of receptionist type folks obsolete. In right. The, so like, in the abstract, but I don't right. Know. No, exactly. So, so the other one he has, like, he likes the, this textbook example about Wiley have like you know, in the in the fall they ramp up because lots of people are buying textbooks. They need more support, and the way he wants to frame it is it's and I label this sort of AI ab- ab- abundance that actually came uh, that that concept kind of occurred to me right after the interview I did so it wasn't actually in the interview but that's why I put it in the headline this mm-hmm. idea of I analogize it to like energy right so right now with energy everyone has a scarcity mindset you know it's like we have to limit our energy we have to you know have more efficiency all these sorts of things and the interesting thing to think about particularly if uh in the long run with solar but also if we do actually commit to building a lot of nuclear is what would we do in a world where of your energy abundance, where energy doesn't have any greenhouse gas sort of concerns. You have as much as you want, like what could you actually do if you had unlimited electricity? And it's actually hard. It's almost hard to think about because it's so counter to the way we think about this by and large, but there, and that actually, the fact it's so hard to grok kind of speaks to what a, a transformative thing it would be, right? Mm-hmm. Like, what would you do if you had infinite energy? Right. We could like terraform I mean, the earth, right? We could with those limits in mind for literally like hundreds of years at this point. Right, exactly, and, and it would be transformative. Like, like there, you know, uh, Casey Hammer had a post this week about like terraforming the Nevada desert, right? Like, like in desalinization plants and all these sorts of things. And and it, it's a fun blog to read because 
why not? Like, why not? Like, would you just just as a thought exercise? What what if you had infinite energy? What could you actually do? And 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 we're we may be approaching that. Like, we may actually see that in our lifetime, particularly with the way that solar costs have gone down and things over time. And that's interesting to think about. The analogy here to the vision that Benioff wants to pitch is: What if you have infinite workers? Don't think about replacing your workers. What if you actually? Right now, workers are a cost center. So you, every time you hire someone, and I think about this as a small business, right? It's a big, like it's a big thing to hire someone. You're committed to them. You're gonna have to pay them. Like your, you, like their, their livelihood and their families are now dependent on you. Like it's a, it's a big burden gotta to buy sort of commander you gotta, jerseys every couple <laughs> years. <laughs> you know, we are in sync because I was just gonna say that I was gonna, that was gonna be. You're right. I, I forgot to expense that. Can I? God, that? Why am I wearing a commander's jersey? Yes, absolutely. Right. No, no you, at, you have. Yeah, you you took a big leap to not to leave the law and to be a professional podcaster. That weighs heavily on me, right? Like that's something that I have to think about, right? But you think about all those stuff in life. What if you actually could hire as many workers as you want at no cost? Like right. what could act? No one's ever actually thought about that because it's never been possible. And that's what he's sort of pitching. Now, in reality, what actually happens is usually every fall, Wiley hires a bunch of temp workers to have their surge. And then they weigh them off because they're temp It's like a holiday yeah, or like a retailer hiring. Basically. Right. Those jobs are being eliminated, right? So, you, like, you, you, I appreciate the vision, but that is an elimination job. Now, those are pretty crappy jobs, attempt jobs, sort of thing that you you get for a few months, and then you have to do something else, or you you something similar with like self driving cars, right? If we actually get to this world of autonomy and all these cars, well, there's a lot of people that have found jobs as Uber drivers, right? Like, what happens when that goes away? And actually, what a lot of stuff that happens is, you know you get shunted off into some the, the worst ones, right? The, the Where they scale up and down or so whatever it might be. So we'll see. There's definitely job losses entailed. Right. But by and large, and it's it, in the long run, more automation, more capabilities do generate more jobs in the long run, more possibilities, more stuff gets created. And, but there is upheaval a, along the way. But, you know, the entire progress of humanity the entire increase in wealth is all downstream from technology doing things Expanded. more. Yeah. Uh, that's right. And so this is good in the fullness of time, but you know, the, 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 the short to medium term is still definitely TBD. There will be some upheaval. What would be really great in the fullness of time is if we could sort of solve the energy issues sometime in our lifetime. That's right. Um, Cause that, that is a prerequisite for, infinite workers right yeah. that, that's the, the ai is a manifestation of energy that that gets stuff done everything's downstream from energy the way like that's and it you know it, and it's, when you think about it it's more likely that we would solve the energy problem than find a way to live on basically half the energy that we currently consume now which is oh for sure this is obviously the, the problems it, it, it's frustrating people that get so focused on the, the, mistakenly and they immiserate themselves. You know, honestly, you see Europe doing this to itself. Like this is why it, it it's sad to watch the decisions Europe makes. And it's it's like it's such a limited view of potential and possibility where it's like we have to immiserate ourselves to save the climate. And like meanwhile, like no, what you need to do, technology will is the key. That's what solves the problem. And, and honestly, maybe AI. No, AI is probably going to be a big deal. But one of AI's biggest contributions, arguably, arguably so far, is all these nuclear announcements, right? I know. Where, I was telling my wife this over the weekend. I was like, after 30 years, AI is such an urgent societal sort of movement that people might actually have to get over themselves. It's been so obvious that we nuclear. should build it, – it, it's one of the biggest – like humanity level screw ups that we're we, the planet is not paid with nuclear reactors, which would give us the unlimited free energy, right? I mean, not unlimited, you have to actually build them, but once they're built, it's clean. It, you're not getting into pollution. Yes, you have to deal with the waste, but relatively speaking, and even the worst accidents and number of people have died, relative people die from like smog or pollution. It's not even remotely close. It's a good example. It's like the self driving car versus car thing. We all obsess about a self driving car accident. 
when in reality and we just completely ignore all the human initiated accidents yeah. which kill tens of thousands of people a year in the u.s alone right and so so it's just hard for humanity to sort of wrap their head around it but it's pretty striking that suddenly it's like out of nowhere the whole world's done a 180 on nuclear. And, it, you know, a lot of the solar advocates think this is all a waste. Solar will just do everything. I think probably like, we've talked about it a little bit, just the baseline capability of nuclear. Particularly, it's such a perfect match for data centers, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know exactly how much you're going to consume. You put them together. They don't even need to be on the grid, arguably. Like, you can imagine like a nuclear reactor and it's matched sort of data center just together. And then the, actually the only connection outside the world is a fiber optic line to carry the data sort of back right. and forth. Right. And, and, and um, I don't, so we'll see how it plays out. I mean, the, the solar bit is, is really interesting and compelling. Obviously, you know, almost all new installed capacity in the U S for the last several years has all been solar. Mm -hmm. One of the funny things is by far the most solar in the U S is in Texas, not in California uh, in that part, because it's the most, it's a more unregulated grid. So there's a lot of arbitrage opportunities um, to sort of take advantage there, particularly with batteries. Uh, Would you pair that with, with solar? All this stuff is um, like, it, it's, this is part, it's not just that AI is coming and this is fun. It's like, we are, there's societal shifts happening. And to the extent AI is driving this energy bit, just because we need energy for AI. No, we need energy for everything. And it's, mm -hmm. it's such, it's, it's exciting well, that we're actually a regulatory thicket for decades now. And yep. if AI can help grease the wheels and uh, make that process easier over the next several years, then it's a great thing for everybody, whether you care about AI or not. So, yep, exactly. Um, yes, we are in year one of a whole new era on a whole bunch of fronts. Uh